Good morning, everyone. God is good all the time. If you believe that, say amen. 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 Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that today your message comes through despite me, a broken vessel. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, for those of you who can, I do have a favor to ask. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Who can do that for me? All right, that's enough. I will take it. I will take it. So over the past few weeks, we've been talking about our stories. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Ann shared a story about faith, her story. And then last week we heard about Mike, and so I'm batting cleanup in the third spot. The metaphor doesn't work, but uh, it's my turn. And I have to admit something. I have to admit that um, every time I preach, I really labor over it for several reasons. Uh, One of the reasons why I labor over it is because it's out of my rhythm. I don't normally preach week in and week out, so it's out of my rhythm. So I have all the stuff I'm doing during the week on top of right, sermon prep, but I really do take it seriously. It's, it's really, I, I grapple with it. I, you know, I took antacids this morning, which is probably just because I'm old, but, <laughs> but this time in particular, uh, it, I labored a, a bit more, and I was, I was struggling to, to figure out why, to really think about that. Okay, how are we doing? Yeah? Okay. So I was really struggling to figure out why. Why, why was I laboring so much over this? And, um, and it's because it's my story. It's because it's a bit more personal. And typically, you know, it, if I was preaching, it's really, uh, it's a bit easier to, you know, you can interject a bit of yourself when you preach, but I love doing the work of exegesis and really just studying scripture, right? And then being able to present on, uh, on the day, hey, this is what I studied. Let's talk about it, right? But today, it's a little bit different. So I really labored over that. And there's this quote by Brene Brown that kind of sums up how I feel. Vulnerability sounds like truth and feels like courage. Truth and courage aren't always comfortable, but they're never weakness. And this is actually really something worth, worth thinking about um, for yourself in those moments When you do place yourself in a vulnerable position, maybe it's in a relationship, right? Maybe it's speaking in public, but it's never a weakness. Truth and courage. So I want to encourage you in that. So I I represent today um, a certain set of people. Pastor Mike talked about this a little bit last week. But I represent a segment of people that don't have a drastic redemption story like a drastic redemption story. There was a a young man that I worked with um, at one of my previous churches, and just an incredible guy, and he had this amazing story. He was a meth addict, but Jesus Christ delivered him from meth, right? I mean, incredible. He told me that he was awake, he was awake for three months straight, but it felt like six months, because he was on meth. I mean, it was crazy. But Jesus Christ delivered him, and he had this incredible story. And there was this one time he went on a mission trip, and he was sharing his story because it's so powerful. And there was a girl there who heard his story, and after he had shared his testimony, she came up to him, and she said, I wish I had your story. I don't have that story. And he said, no, you don't. You don't wish that you had this story, but I think sometimes we romanticize the incredible redemption story because it's a great story. And I don't want to take anything away from that that narrative. That's actually a really great story if it's your story. But it's not my story. My story is different. Because my story is, you know, as you compare it, it's pretty vanilla. I grew up in a great family, right? But here's the thing. Here's, here's actually the, the really important piece, okay? The really important piece is this. 
the, the trajectory of my life. God changed the trajectory of my life, and He still does. Wherever my life was going to head, right, because of God, my life had a different trajectory. And that's really important to remember because the trajectory of my life continues to change. It continues to shift. As you follow Christ in a life of faith, what ends up happening is wherever you thought you were going to end up, just throw it out the window. Because God can take you literally wherever he wants. And you'll be surprised in the life of faith as we have conversations, finding out where folks are from and where they've, where they've come from. And if we have this conversation again in a year, five years, ten years, where's God taking you? I'll be really curious to see where he takes us. So the trajectory of my life has changed. Now, so I'll talk a little bit about my family of origin. There they are. Some of you met, actually, my parents when they came out to visit. You may have met my brothers as well. But, um, so, uh, there's my dad on the left, there's my mom on the right. You probably recognize those two, uh, those two dudes. Uh, the little ones, and then I am the middle child. Yeah, right? So, so now you're psychoanalyzing me. <laughs> you're like, okay, man, I, I know you're damaged now. <laughs> I know what's wrong with you. <laughs> and I'm not denying it, right? So <laughs> there's my older brother on the left and my younger brother on the right. And great guys, Jared and John. Um, and so... Uh, we grew up, and it was, you know, we grew up in a, in a home where we did, like, Bible trivia. How many of you remember this game, the Ten Commandments? I always wondered what a husbandman was. Uh, but we used to play this game on Sabbath afternoon, and we would do Bible trivia all the time. I was really into it. I really liked the names. Mephibosheth, I mean, right? <laughs> I really liked going deep and trying to do that and beat my older brother, whom I never could beat. And we would also do these Bible drawing contests, which was not fair because he was always a better artist than I was. So I gave up. I just don't even draw anymore. Uh, but we always used to do that. And so that was fun. Every Friday night, we'd, we'd do Bible trivia. Uh, we played the Ten Commandments game. And then on Sabbath, there were certain Sabbath-sanctioned movies that we would watch, right? Like Ben-Hur. Or, I, mean, I mean, the Ten Commandments. Right? <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, you know what the next movie is, right? That, that was the Ten Commandments we used to watch, and then Ben-Hur, and I loved it because it took the whole Sabbath to watch these movies. If you've ever seen, right? I mean, they're just epic, right? And then we learned all the lines, Nefertiri, right? And see, kids, I'm talking to your parents now. You guys grew up with, like, Prince of Egypt, that kind of thing. And then we used to watch, uh, you know, Ben-Hur and the chariot scene and Masala, we, uh, <laughs> we really got into it. But this was kind of my childhood growing up. I attended Adventist school, Orangewood Academy, home of the Spartans. Uh, I went there from first grade to 12th grade. And I grew up with Bible class. And I learned about God. It seemed like, you know, just on all sides. From, from home and then from school. And we went to church as well. And here's the thing. We were like Revelation Seminar groupies. We used to go, I used to go to so many Revelation Seminars, right? And I was into it. I'd get the stickers. And then, you know, after you attended a certain number of times, you got a free Bible. So I had this collection of Bibles that I got from Revelation <laughs> Seminars. And we used to go to uh, Kenneth Cox. I don't know how many of you remember the old evangelist, Kenneth Cox. We used to go to Kenneth Cox uh, <laughs> Seminars and... And so we would go through kind of that whole process. And I, I was, you know, 2,300 days, 70 weeks. Um, <laughs> we would break it down, and we would get into it. Now, here's one of the things that, that ended up happening, though. For those of you who know me, and maybe you've heard me speak before. But I talked a little bit before about how I was in second grade. And how I had this existential crisis. You remember, I was walking... Uh, from the classroom to music class. I felt the sun shining. It was great. And then I just had this weird thought that maybe I was the only person on earth and no one else really existed, right? <laughs> and it freaked me out a little bit. But 
You know, it was kind of this cogito ergo sum, right? I think, therefore I am. I can prove my own existence. I can't prove that anyone else is real. This was in second grade. So you can, you can kind of guess where I'm going here. Because what I started to do was I started to think about my process. It was about fourth grade, you know, it was probably my third revelation seminar or something like that. <laughs> and I started thinking about how scared I was because I really was scared. All of the things that I was hearing in these seminars was about fear, about being afraid for various reasons. And there was something that didn't, compu it, it didn't compute, it didn't make sense to me. How, like why should I be so afraid? Is that really what, what my process and my spirituality is based on? Is that really what it's about? And I read a text in the Bible, 1 John 4, right, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. You can understand how I was having an issue. And this was kind of back in fourth grade. How do I put this together? Because it feels like people are trying to scare me right now. But how does that line up with a loving God and this text. How can I put it together? So I was thinking about that, and, and in the midst of that too, I was thinking, well, am I saved? Am I not saved? Right? Am I going to be with God? Or am I not going to be with God? You know? And I was scared. I was going to sleep scared at night. But there is, and I'll just say this, okay? There will be various promises that I'll just say. There is assurance of salvation. There absolutely is assurance of salvation. We can know without a doubt that because of Jesus, we can be sure of salvation. In fact, look, later in that same book, John writes, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know I guess that you may know that you have eternal life. It's, it's not even an, an issue. Jason, are you going to be there? Absolutely. Yes. And you can be sure too. It's not even a question. God, God, is, God is a good God. We don't need to worry about these things. So, so this was kind of my process through elementary school. I was always into church, uh, always... You know, my parents maybe placed piano and special music and stuff. <laughs> Again, the damage kind of comes back out. <laughs> but, so, there was that, and then high school came, right? In high school, um, I had the privilege of meeting Heidi, right? Yes, yes. Now... So we've known each other for a long time. In fact, one of, one of the, um, the big moments for me was realizing that I had spent more of my life with her than without her. Now, I don't know how many of you have kind of reached a point like that in your relationship, but that was kind of a big moment for me. We've known each other for a long time. We grew up together in a lot of ways. Um, but I am going to say something about um, just a little bit of real talk, okay? And, and how I understand romance, how I understand relationships, right? I do not believe in soulmates at all. I just don't. Yeah, I know, I know. Collective gasp, <gasps> right? I don't believe in soulmates at all. Because soulmates are actually derived from a Greek concept that once upon a time we had two faces and four arms and, and four legs and the gods got angry at us and split us apart. And now you are destined to go find your other half, right? And we still talk this way sometimes, and this is my better half. Well, Heidi's definitely better than I am, right? But when it comes down to this half and this idea of soulmates, I don't believe in that. that you're fated to be with someone. And so what I end up doing is, right, it kind of go goes against the Hollywood notion of romance, right? Oh, Hollywood, because of course it's all gonna work out, right? They're meant to be together. But you tell me what's more romantic, okay? This idea that you are meant to be together outside of your control 
or the fact that I choose Heidi. I chose her, and I choose her every day. And she chose me, and she chooses me every day. To me, that's a basis of a relationship. It's this choice, because love can't exist without choice. Now, regardless of how you got together, there is a choice involved. And so, I just want to, all right, two cents. I've got the mic, <laughs> I'm kind of talking, right? This is how I understand it, because God, He chooses us, right? And because of that, we have an opportunity to choose Him. So, for those of you who have found your person, continue choosing each other. For those of you who haven't, um, I, I want to encourage you. And I just want to say, find someone who will call you forward into God's kingdom. Someone who will challenge you to grow in the things of God. Right? Heidi has been incredible for me. She has challenged me in so many ways and continues to do that. And she helped, she, just having her in my life, right? Because she, she talks straight. It's real talk. It's honest. She lets me know. But the idea is, she, she helps me become the man that I want to be. The man of God that I'm called to be. So find someone like that in your own life. Right? Who will help you. Um, okay, so <laughs> here's the thing. Just kind of on the romance thing. I was ba asked back in college to speak for... Um, I was asked to speak for a women's dorm chapel on Valentine's Day. <laughs> Which you should say no to <laughs> if you ever get asked. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, don't say no. Just go ahead and do it. But the, uh, I was, it was very daunting. I was like, what am I going to say to single women on Valentine's Day for a chapel? Right? I'm in a relationship, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But what am I going to say to them? And what I ended up uh, talking about was John chapter 10. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with John chapter 10, but Jesus says two things, two I am statements. I am the door, right, or the gate. I am the door that the sheep go through, and I am the good shepherd. Now, how does that make any sense for val Valentine's Day talk to single women? What I told them was this. I said, the way that you're going to find your person is by following the shepherd. That's actually how. Because as you follow the shepherd, guess who's following the shepherd? Other sheep. <laughs> well, what are you doing, sheep? Well, I'm following him. What are you doing? Oh, I'm following him. All of a sudden, we're talking to each other. This is how it's done. You find your person by following the shepherd. You follow the shepherd, you're going to find a sheep that's following the shepherd. I think it worked. <laughs> that's what I'll say about romance. <laughs> okay, so I got to college, right? Heidi and I got to college. I, I went to Pacific Union College, um, which is an incredible school on the West Coast and just a beautiful campus. And I was an undecided major. Later, they changed that major to deciding, right? Because they wanted to be positive about your lack of commitment. <laughs> but I was undecided, right? With a music minor. Now, why did I have a music minor? Simply because of this. They had a policy that if you were a music minor, you could get free music lessons. So I took double bass, and I actually played in the orchestra. It was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, yeah, it was fun. I wish I could afford one because they're so great. <laughs> but but I, was, I was doing this, I, I was deciding, etc. And I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life. I had no idea. I thought I wanted to be a physics teacher, believe it or not. I love science. And physics to me made a lot of sense. You know, there are certain, there are certain uh, sciences that, that make less sense to me. Like, uh, like chemistry or, you know, I can't see chemistry. I mean, I reap the benefits of chemistry, but I can't really see it. But physics, I can see everywhere, you know? You're sitting in a chair. That's physics, right? I mean, it's, right? Weather systems, that's physics. I mean, it, it, it just makes sense to me. 
So I was thinking uh, along those lines, uh, maybe going into engineering and building some base cabinets. Thought that would have been fun. And it's actually not too far off of what I'm doing now. The reality is, and this is the way I see it, I, do, I don't see science as uh, conflicting with the things of God. I just don't. You know, some folks try to say that there's a, a war of science and religion. I don't. I think they're complementary. In fact, look at this text in the Bible. Psalm chapter 119, verse 89 says, Your word, you have to understand, right? There, there are lots of different iterations of the word of the Lord. Lots of different versions of what the, Lord, the, the word is. Right? Jesus Christ is the word incarnate, right? We refer to the Bible as God's word. But look at this iteration of your word, right? God's word. Lord is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens, or it upholds, it sustains the heavens. That's natural law. God's word is revealed to us through the things in nature that we see. And to me, I saw physics. It made sense. It made God beautiful to me. It made sense of the world. And that's what we try to do uh, here as, as pastors. We try to make sense of the world in a different way. So to me, it wasn't, it wasn't too much of a stretch. Well, what ended up happening was, it was week of prayer, and the religious vice president had asked me if I'd be willing to speak for student week of prayer. And um, I really, again, I labored over that. Apparently that's what I do, I just labor over things. But I really struggled over this. I was like, should I do it, should I not? I don't know, I'm kind of afraid of speaking. I, I don't know how this is all gonna work out. And I called up an old mentor, an old youth pastor, I said, I don't know what I should do. What should I do? And he said, Jason, you should speak. And here's why. He said, if you ever get asked to speak, you should, because it will challenge what you believe. And I want to extend that challenge to you as well. If you ever get asked to speak, to share your testimony, or to testify about God in some way, you should do it. Right? And you, maybe right now you're wrestling with this. Well, you should do it. I'm just telling you right now. If someone has asked you to testify, you should. The reason why is because it'll challenge what you believe. You know, it's one thing to, to believe something privately. It's a whole other thing to stand up in front of people and actually say, this is what's happening. This is where I'm at. Remember what Brene Brown said about vulnerability. It's never weakness. And when you testify about God, what ends up happening is those, those beliefs, they become real. They become solidified. You think twice before you say stuff in public. At least you should. <laughs> so I had a chance to speak, and it really, it really rocked me. Because at that point, I realized something. I realized that um, the things that I cared about, right, the burdens on my heart, the things that I thought were important, the way I was wired, um, really all kind of pointed toward pastor. Ah, <laughs> I was like, really? Is this really, is this really what, what I'm meant to do? And I really, really struggled over that. Now, I'll say something. There, in, in a spiritual process, uh, there's something called the second naivete, right? Here it is, second naivete. The first naivete happens when you are growing up and everything is secondhand. Right? You inherit maybe the religion of your parents and this kind of idea. And you just, it's what you have. And it's not, it's not bad, it's just what you have. Right? You've grown up with it, and that's what it is. But you reach a point where you have to choose whether or not you're going to own your own faith. You do have to get to that point. And when, when it happens, it's different for everyone. But at some point, you have to choose it. Or not, you have to reject it and maybe choose something for yourself. And once you make that choice, some of those spaces, some of, some of those liminal spaces, some of the places of tension where there aren't easy answers, and when we talk about spiritual things, there are always going to be those areas. There are always going to be areas that are ambiguous and difficult to deal with. When you get to those points, when you get to those spots, there's something called the second naivete. 
and the third and the fourth and the fifth, etc. But it's this idea that you can live with the tension of that space, of not knowing. It's okay. I don't need to know, but I know the one who does. And I can be in that space. It's uncomfortable, right? But that's okay because all growth happens because of tension and struggle, right? It's the same concept when you're building muscle, right? You have to break down the muscle to build it back up. It's the same thing spiritually. So we have these naivetes, but that's the second naivete. And what ends up happening is we own our faith. So I do have a confession, and the confession is this. I really have a cognitive approach to spirituality. I mean, you can kind of tell probably just the way I'm speaking. You know, you heard about me in second grade, you heard about me in fourth grade, and it's this idea I really do try to think through, think through my spiritual process. And so trying to put it together, right, with this fear piece, and I, I needed to find some kind of center. What is my life actually going to be about? Right? What am I going to base my faith on? And I keep coming back to the person of Jesus Christ. He is the single most transformative character in all of human history. The single most. This world is completely different because of him. Period. And C.S. Lewis was right when he said you have to do something with him. He's just so compelling. He's so incredible. Now, here's the thing, though. I'm a lot different now than I used to be. And what happened was this. Um, I had a chance to, um, go to go to a breakfast um, that this man was at. His name is Dallas Willard. He died a few years ago, but an incredible Christian thinker. He's a professor of philosophy at USC. That's what he used to do before he passed away. And just, just a, a profound thinker. And he was asked by his students why he's a Christian. So I, I loved his answer so much I co-opted it because it made so much sense to me. But it's this idea, they ask, you've studied all of these other philosophies, I mean literally all of these other philosophies, yet you are a Christian, why? It's a really good question, isn't it? Especially in today's world, it seems like this is the kind of question that we should be interested in answering. And how would you answer? It's a really good question. Why are you a Christian? Here's what he said. And I love it. This is what I say. He said, In all of human history, Jesus Christ is the person who can best teach me how to live. If you can find someone better, then I'll follow him. Here's what I love about that. He's not afraid. He's not afraid. I, I've studied the philosophies. I've seen other approaches. And for me, Jesus Christ is the one who can teach me best how to live. But try to find someone better. Go ahead. Go ahead. Not afraid. And it's very non-confrontational, which I love. I don't need to prove my point. And I think a lot of times we get caught up in that. Where it's like, I need to prove why I'm right. You really don't. Jesus Christ, he can take care of himself. In fact, he, ta he takes care of me. Come on now. Come on now. And it goes back to this principle that truth can bear scrutiny. If something's true, it's true. That's just it. Look at it any way you like, right? If it's a diamond, it's a diamond. No matter if you're under it or above it, it's just what it is. You don't need to be afraid. Jesus Christ is okay for himself. And so there are these ideas. I mean, even Jesus Christ himself said, he said, I'm the way, the truth, 
and the life. Do you believe him? Or not? You really do have to do something with him. And then in John 12, right, he says, if I'm lifted up, I'll draw all people to myself. Will he? See, we have to do something with the things he said. We either take him seriously or we don't. It's one way or another. And I'm just explaining my process. This is my process. It doesn't have to be yours. Now, C.S. Lewis uh, wrote something uh, in Mere Christianity, and you may remember the, the text, right? He said something that I think, and I've mentioned this before, I think um, had an effect that he didn't intend. He said, you can't just call Jesus a great moral teacher. Right? He said he's either a lunatic or the devil of hell. He, he's a madman or something worse. You remember this quote? Right? He said he's either the son of God or one of these things, but you have to do something with Jesus. Right? He's either the son of God and the, the Lord himself. But here's the thing. What we ended up doing as Christians is we said, you can't call Jesus a, moral, a great moral teacher, but we've forgotten that he is the best teacher ever of all time. So now as Christians, and you'll, you'll, you'll notice this, we want Jesus to save us, but we don't want him to master us. We don't want him to be our Lord. We don't want him to teach us how to live. Save us, we want to go to heaven, but I don't want to change. And I think that's been the effect. I'm going to keep living the way I want. I'm not going to take you seriously, but please save me. And I think this is a huge problem. Because I believe Jesus when he says certain things. And following him, right, following him doesn't make your life easier. It makes your life better. It doesn't make your life easier. It makes it better. Right? Loving your enemies, easy, better, right? Praying for people who persecute you, easy, better. It shifts your thinking. But these are the things he actually said. What do you do with him? Jesus Christ. I have to share that because that's my process. Jesus' voice, for those who claim to follow him, Jesus' voice should be the clearest, loudest, and most in influential voice in your life. You have a lot of voices in your life, right? Lots of people talking, right? You got your girl, you call up, hey, this is going on. <laughs> what do you think I should do, right? Or maybe you listen to like, I don't know, uh, talk radio or pundits or whatever, right? The clearest, loudest, most influential voice in your life, if you claim to follow Jesus, should be his. It's true for me. It's true for you. All right. So this is why I'm a Christian. Now, I will say this about being an Adventist. I love being an Adventist. I really do like being, not just like, I love being a Seventh-day Adventist. And I'll tell you why. Right now, in the Seventh-day Adventist church, if you're not familiar with it, there are basically two major questions. What does it mean to be an Adventist? And who gets to decide? And right now, there, there are going to be some meetings kind of talking about some of these ideas. But those are the big two questions. But I love being an Adventist, and I'll tell you why. I think we have really good DNA as a religion. We've got great DNA. And the DNA is this. We were wrong, but we're trying to figure out what's right. Now, it's recognized across all religions that humility is a virtue. And as far as humility goes, that's part of our DNA. We were wrong. But we're trying to figure out what's right. That is a really good position to be in, and that's our DNA as people. I love being an Adventist. Okay, so with that said, <clears throat> I might not be telling you the truth today. <laughs> I don't think you heard me. I might not be telling you the truth today. I might actually be lying to you. Yeah, I know. That's really... 
Now you're questioning everything. Which way is up? I don't even know. I take it really seriously when I preach. In Philippians uh, chapter 2, it says, Work your salvation out with fear and trembling. And in James chapter 3, it says, Not all of you should be teachers, because teachers will be judged more harshly. I'm actually going to stand in account because of all the things I've said. All the things I teach, I stand in account. I take it really seriously. You know, I do, the reality is, I want to be with God. But I do have to stand in account for what I say. The reason why I bring that up is this. You should test Jesus. You should give it a try. You should go back into your Bible or find a Bible if you don't have one. You could grab a Bible. We have Bibles there on the shelves. Just grab one on your way out. It's fine. Find those red words. Start reading them and let him teach you how to live. Test him. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. I actually believe him. He says, seek first the kingdom of heaven. Right? And all these things will be added. I believe him. Seek him. In fact, in Luke, right, the Luke version of that same text, he says, just seek. He doesn't say seek first. He just says seek the kingdom. I believe him when he says that. It's worth looking into. So the world has changed and continues to change, obviously. The rate of change is changing. Change is changing all around us, right? So how do we navigate this? And who's going to teach us how to navigate this? I came up with long ago that I am unfit to teach myself how to live. I just can't do it. I'm really not that smart. But I think Jesus is. Now, <clears throat> here's one other piece. Um, Brian McLaren wrote a book called More Ready Than You Realize, a really great book on evangelism. And in it, he recounts a process that he's had. The process goes like this. He was a young pastor, and he had Bible studies. He was going to take someone through Bible studies. You'll understand a little bit about me when I tell this story. He took his person through Bible studies, through the whole deal, and then at the end, he asked the young man he was studying with, would you like to be baptized? Now, in the past, that's the process, right? You go through, and then baptism at the end. But here's what the young man said. He said, no. And Brian asked, why? And the young man said, because I don't want to be like you. I used to win a whole lot of arguments, but I was a huge jerk. Who knows what I'm talking about? A huge jerk. But the world has changed. The old way of doing things, it's irrelevant now. I don't want to be like you. There's a quote by Madeline Lengel. Look at this. She wrote this. We draw people to Christ not by loudly discrediting what they believe, by telling them how wrong they are and how right we are, but by showing them a light that is so lovely that they want with all their hearts to know the source of it. Amen. It's not by loudly discrediting people. The stakes are higher now because it's called apologetics, defending the faith. But what used to work was reason and argument. It doesn't work anymore. People are looking at your life. I don't care what you say. Show me how this works. The stakes are actually higher now. If you claim Christ, people are looking at your life and they want to know that life is better with him. That's what they're looking at. Do you have something that I want? Can you show me the source of a light that's so beautiful that I want it to? That's our call. It's higher. But it's for real. I'm walking you through this because this is my process. This is my story. This is how I think. Hey, you guys are psychoanalyzing me so hard. <laughs> You're where you are because someone in your life, because there's someone in your life that God wants to show his love to. 
It's absolutely true. And we have a unique opportunity now. We have a really unique opportunity to show God's love in creative ways, to be creative in relationships, and to show people how much God loves them. This is, these are the stakes now, right? This is what I've been dealing with. This is where I'm at. That's why I have to share it. And so wherever you are now, there's a, a question, and it lingers. And here's the question, what's next? There's always something next. And that's why I said maybe we should have this conversation again in one year, five years, or ten years. Because the reality is, Jesus said to his disciples, you'll be brought before governors and kings. I have no idea, and that's one thing I've learned about this region. You have no idea who you're talking to, ever. You just have no clue. So consistency in life is really important. God can take you wherever he wants. He can take you in front of kings, in front of presidents, to testify about his goodness and to show them how much God loves them. Will he do it? He might. He just might. Will you be ready to show radical love? Will you be ready? Will I be ready? What's next? And there's always something next. The sooner you join with God, the sooner you'll see how your story fits into his story. And it's really about him and what he's doing. And this is the last text, because what you end up doing is you fill in the pages together with him. My story is my story. And there's God's story. And he's actually doing something. And what happens is our stories line up where I can actually join his story. And what he's doing is this. Well, what's next? I'll tell you what's next. And through him to reconcile to himself all things. It's talking about Jesus. He's reconciling to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the, shed on the cross. See, the cross wasn't just about personal salvation. We are saved because of Jesus and, and his work on the cross. But he's literally reconciling everything to himself. And he's asked us to be a part of it. This is where our stories line up. This is where we get to, I love my job as a pastor, I really do. Because as a pastor, I get to sit on the front row and watch God work in the lives of people. It's really cool. I have a unique vantage point in that way. And all of you actually have that same opportunity. If you're willing to step into that space and see God work in the lives of people, what's he gonna do in you and through you? Because guess what? He's reconciling everything to himself. And like Pastor Ann said two weeks ago, everything means everything. He's inviting us to be a part of that. I have to share this with you because it's, it's just, it's so good what he's inviting us to. And as we wrap up this series on stories, what I'm interested in is God's story, God's dream, and what his desire is for this church. What, what's he really calling us to do? Maybe to break off that veneer, right? Where it's like, hey, listen, we're New Hope. We look good. We're doing our thing, whatever. Maybe he's calling us to be people who actually take him seriously. What would it look like if there were a, was a community that said, you know what? We are actually going to do the things that Jesus said. What, what does that look like in real life? Pray about that. Pray about that and then read some of those words, the red ones. And see how your life becomes not easier, but better. <laughs>